So our topic today is, does herbicide use compromise biodiversity in Alberta's forests? Now, uh, before I launch into this, uh, I'd like to do a couple of things. First off, I'd like to thank FGRO for supporting this project. I think it's a tremendously important initiative, especially in times where herbicide use in any context is under considerable scrutiny, and certainly herbicide use for forest management is under increasing scrutiny all the time. Uh, the second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to make it a very strong point that this is not my work. This is the work of a team, an incredible team of people. Uh, John Nash, who many of you from Alberta will know, I'm sure, uh, led the, uh, the uh, field portions of this and also worked uh, very much in the uh, development of comparative tools. Uh, Jula Gulyash from uh, Vancouver did all the work around wood volumes and the, sort of the, the tree portion of this project. And Sonia Odson from Fuse Consulting uh, has been instrumental in pulling all of this together into a, uh, a coherent message. And the, the point of this exercise really is to look uh, at longer term effects of herbicide use for reforestation. The challenge we have in, in the forests we work in is no one ever sees a rotation. Our forests are very long lived, very slow to maturity. And as a consequence, uh, we often lose sight of that, that longer term uh, outcome in in our day-to-day -day lives and i've had the privilege of working in a number of systems where uh the forest uh, cycle was shorter and as a consequence uh foresters were able to see that whole rotation and uh, i found that an incredibly challenging environment to work in because you were always thinking out to that long-term outcome uh in our system like i say we we don't have that privilege um, what we have done is we have learned a lot about reforestation of the boreal forest. And Brian mentioned that I've had a fairly long career, and that career has uh, been around the boreal forest for a very significant proportion of, the, of my time. And uh, I've seen tremendous improvements in reforestation over that time. Uh, among the biggest are a much better understanding of how to propagate trees. So better stock, better stock handling, uh, better stock uh, type match to site. Um, and uh, certainly stand tending and competition management. So uh, huge improvements in reforestation over time. Uh, we've done a tremendous job of documenting uh, the impact of those reforestation techniques, particularly in the short to midterm. Uh, one of my big frustrations over my many years of, of working in reforestation is a lack of two things. It's a lack of treatment-specific effects data, and especially treatment-specific effects data over the longer term. We do a great job of documenting, you know, five, 10, even 20-year effects of reforestation treatments. We're not so good at getting out to the 25 to 40-year effects. And in particular, when we start moving out into those longer term effects, we tend to focus on wood fiber. And uh, one of the most cogent points I've ever had made to me uh, around this whole question of herbicide use is when uh, Margaret He, who at the time was a forester for uh, Alberta Land and Forest Services, that, you know, we misunderstand the public, we misunderstand stakeholders, we think that they see forests as trees, because that's how we see forests. But in fact, 
stakeholders see trees as essentially the structure around which a forest is woven. And they're seeing a whole lot of other things besides the trees and those other things are definitional to their forest. And when we talk to those people about trees, uh, we tend to lose them because they really don't have that same paradigm as we do. And I think one of the great uh, misfortunes of our monitoring efforts over time has been that we haven't put as much effort and attention into uh, biodiversity and forest complexity uh, assessments as we might have or maybe should have. And uh, I, on the previous slide, I made the point that I'm going to do a quick review of shorter term outcomes. Uh, shorter term outcomes in the boreal forest are about up to 15 years post harvest. Uh, I'm going to put a lot of time into discussing transitional phase outcomes, which take us up to about 40 years post harvest. And this is a really critical phase because this is where the young stand is no longer a reforested cut block, but in fact is now new forest. And uh, then the final phase is the second growth phase, which is that uh, where we go from young forest to mature forest or a second harvest. And I'm not going to touch that phase today because I've got no data to talk to it whatsoever. And as I was trying to say earlier, uh, we have abundant information on short-term response to silvicultural practices, including herbicides. Uh, we have some, but very little uh, medium-term response information, and we have no long-term response information. And one of the challenges we face is that what stakeholders tend to measure our uh, impact against is against the forest that was harvested. So they're looking at the new forest versus uh, a mature forest that was harvested, and we're not very well equipped to discuss uh, how well we're doing uh, against that, nor are we tremendously well equipped to uh, talk about specific treatments and impact of specific treatments. And as I alluded to earlier, throughout my career, I've struggled mightily with having untreated controls for specific silvicultural treatments so that I could then say, this is what that treatment did. Uh, instead, what we have is sort of a roll up of all the silviculture and say, great outcome, but what contributed um, more what contributed less to this outcome. And we certainly need that. Uh, so in this particular project, what we did is we revisited a series of stands that Doug Pitt and I measured back in 2003. And when we measured them back then, what we were really concerned about is uh, what were the implications for mixed wood silviculture and mixed wood forestry in Alberta of using herbicides? Uh, Alberta has a very strong uh, mixed wood forest base where uh, there's a, a considerable industry based on aspen producing both oriented strand board and craft pulp and a very strong conifer industry that produces pulp and dimensional lumber. And as a consequence, when we have mixed composition forests, we're, we're talking about mill furnish or, or commercial forest for both industries. And um, so Doug and I were looking into that and we really didn't look at biodiversity. But what we did do is we established plots in a series of herbicide monitoring blocks that had been established about 10 years prior to when we measured them. And those plots had large scale untreated controls. So we were able to compare uh, the same silviculture regime on treated with herbicide versus not treated with herbicide basis and uh, look for impacts on the tree side of things. Now, with the ongoing concern about herbicides in particular with clearly with indigenous people expressing concerns about plants of importance to them 
uh, when we started discussing doing this remeasurement, uh, EFGRO was of the opinion that we had to uh, look at biodiversity uh, as well as tree volume. I mean, tree volume is important in explaining to a company manager why we're spending the money. Biodiversity is how we answer stakeholder concerns. And it's especially important that we treat biodiversity as a co-equal to volume because it's that biodiversity or that complexity that is uh, what the stakeholder sees as the value they hold dear. They may not phrase it that way, but that's what their values tend to pivot around. And uh, like I say, FGRO funded us to revisit these. And the, the big value of these plots is that untreated control. Uh, we did report that in the Forestry Chronicle. So if you want to read that paper, it's available to you. And uh, our, our interests in this were really uh, to look at the wood fiber responses to date. I mean, we need something to explain to managers uh, why uh, we use herbicides. It's certainly not something that people choose to do recreationally. Uh, we're also looking at projecting uh, those wood fiber responses forward through time. And most importantly for our discussion here today is we want, to do a we wanted to do a detailed analysis of plant biodiversity comparing treated and untreated areas. And, you know, in the time between our 2004 measurement and the 2019 measurement, there uh, have been tremendous improvements in uh, sensing technology. And what you see here is a drone orthograph produced by uh, John Nash and his folks over at GreenLink Forestry. Uh, where you know we can see the treated and the untreated portions of the block. And I'll tell you what, uh, they can get these down to a scale where you can practically see the plot stakes in the, uh, in the measurement plots. It's tremendous uh, advance in, in assessing uh, reforestation outcomes at a broad scale. And like I said before, we have a huge amount of information on early responses to herbicide. And I've listed a few papers here. Brian has a reference list that has several more papers on it. Uh, the, the gist of it is that uh, herbicides increase both the survival and the growth of conifer, which results in a tremendous increase in conifer volume whether you measure it as cubic meters or biomass. Uh, and that's paralleled by a substantial or considerable reduction in deciduous volume. And, you know, if you're only going to read one paper about the wood fiber side of things, this is the one to read. Uh, this, this paper uh, was uh, published in uh, forestry back about 15 years ago. But what it does is it sum summarizes the effect of herbicide use on, uh, for reforestation purposes on wood fiber productivity. And it looks around the world. It looks at North America. It looks at South Africa. It looks at New Zealand. And uh, essentially a meta-analysis. And as you can see here, there are tremendous gains in volume associated with use of herbicides for competition management in the reforestation process. And uh, in that shorter time frame, that sort of reforestation phase, as I described it earlier, there are a bunch of studies uh, around uh, impacts on biodiversity or plant community composition. Uh, probably the, uh, the most telling of those studies is uh, a review or meta-analysis done by Lautenschlager and Sullivan uh, back in 2002. Uh, and, you know, they, they really came to the conclusion that um, herbicide use results in a very short-term depression in plant biodiversity. And then there's an, a substantial change in the dominance of the woody plant composition. So, um, you know, we know that. And 
candidly, that second bullet is why people use herbicides for competition management, is we want to shift the dominance toward tree species that we deem commercial. And again, if you're going to read just one paper, uh, I would recommend reading the Lawton Schlager and Sullivan Review. Uh, it's pretty exhaustive. You can see there it's about 35 pages long. And uh, one of their major conclusions is that herbicide treatments do not reduce and may increase stand or landscape level plant species richness. So uh, uh, again, we know this. Uh, we need to do a good job of sharing it with people. But what does this mean in the longer term? And there's another but here, and this is uh, probably because of how my forestry career started. I worked in northern Alberta in reforestation, and my major challenge was Calamagrostis canadensis, or blue joint reedgrass. And uh, what we find when we're dealing with blue joint reedgrass is that herbicide treatments generally increase biodiversity following treatment. And the reason for that is that Calamagrostis is an incredibly aggressive competitor. Uh, we operate in the boreal forest on very thin, relatively cold soils. And reed grass is very effective at filling that root space and depressing soil temperature. And as a consequence, uh, suppressing the trees we desire. and uh, like I say, I've got a phobia, so I'm going to just leave it there. <laughs> uh, when we move from that reforestation phase to the transitional phase, we start running out of legs. Uh, we've got fewer studies. Uh, there are a few listed here. And um, we um, don't have a whole lot of information about biodiversity. Uh, what we show still is substantial, modest to substantial increases in fiber volume, or at least softwood volume, and that's attended by a parallel reduction in deciduous fiber volume. And as a consequence, uh, you know, we're, we're deciding here what we're emphasizing. And like I say, not a lot of, um, uh, biodiversity response. So in uh, 2019, EFRO funded uh, myself and GreenLink Forestry uh, to remeasure the plots that Pitt and I uh, established back in 2003. And in this case, assess both the impact on conifer, assess impact on Aspen as a crop species, and most importantly, assess impact on plant community composition and abundance. And the, the critical piece here is these untreated reference plots, because they give us that baseline where we can actually measure that effect from. Now, as a sidebar, uh, when Pitt and I did this original measurement, uh, we measured 12. And you can see here, we only did eight in 2019. The reason for that was that we'd lost them. They'd been retreated. In one case, we had a power line built across uh, our untreated plot. Um, in another case, we had a pipeline that took out the untreated plot. So, uh, you know, it's, that's typical of long-term work. So uh, I felt really fortunate that we still had eight installations that we could remeasure admit and assess against that untreated control. And what we found, I mean, there's, a, there's the, uh, the, the timber volumes. And I, I told you we weren't emphasizing timber volumes, but you know, we're foresters and so we have to measure it. And as you can see uh, that essentially uh, we, uh, we changed the, uh, the aspen volume pretty consistently. We generally reduced it. And likewise, we generally increased the conifer volume. What I found very interesting is that we actually uh, did a pretty good job of increasing total volume in a number of cases. Uh, and so here's the numbers, which I, I find a little easier to follow than the bar chart. 
And uh, you can see here that, like I say, Aspen generally declined. There were a few exceptions, uh, but on average, it was uh, uh, fairly significant decrease in aspen volume, but the increase in conifer volume tended to exceed the decrease in aspen volume, which in turn means that um, we increased total standing wood volume on the site. And I suspect that's mostly a function of the fact that the silviculturists who did the initial reforestation on these sites did an incredibly good job of uh, site preparation and planting and espacement. And so we ended up with a much more uh, fully occupied site with conifer, which when we released it meant that we didn't have the sort of gaps that would have accompanied uh, um, a naturally reforested stand. So uh, interesting outcome here. When we looked at biodiversity, uh, we were a bit on our own. Really the only exception uh, to uh, what we've done is work done uh, in Maine at Austin Pond. And this is a trial started in the 1970s. It was the first research use of glyphosate as a forestry herbicide. It compared glyphosate, triclopyr, uh, and uh, it also compared them uh, tank mixed with phenoxy herbicides. Uh, this was done by Max McCormick, and that site has been followed, uh, I wouldn't say at absolutely fixed intervals, but certainly at intervals ever since. So uh, they're well past 40 years now on that study uh, and have, have reported results. And on their earlier, uh, in the earlier reporting, they only reported volumes, but in the most recent uh, work around Austin Pond, they looked at biodiversity and uh, they, uh, they had a number of different treatments. They had more treatments than we did. Um, and what they came to, because they had uh, essentially uh, a suite of treatments that were integrated, so herbicide, pre-commercial thinning, and then uh, a combination of herbicide and pre-commercial thinning, uh, they've got a lot more to say than we do. But when they looked just at herbicides, what they found was that the herbicides tested, so those included, like I say, glyphosate, triclopyr, and phenoxies, had no long-term effect on ground vegetation cover, richness, and diversity. Uh, and that's as compared to the untreated control. So what did we found? find. Well, uh, John did a really good job of essentially describing the plant community out there. And he uh, essentially described all the species present and gave us covers on all of them. And that put us in the position of needing to roll uh, all that information up into uh, some indices that would help us uh, understand changes in diversity uh, at, at, at a single glance. I mean, you know, when you're looking at 30 or 35 species, it just gets overwhelming to try and say, well, it went up here and down there. And, you know, and just uh, you end up with more noise than information. So we chose to use the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index. Even this, uh, John also brought in the idea of looking at the presence and cover of site typical species. These are the species that uh, are included in the ecosite description in the Alberta Ecosite uh, Guide. And seeing uh, if those species fell in or fell out, depending on herbicide use. Uh, so we, we did all that and we started comparing treated to untreated uh, sites and we, we went at this a couple of ways initially. We started looking at individual openings and also at a roll up of all the openings and doing the comparison using students t-test. And uh, when we did that, what we found was, you know, that we were seeing more trends. If there was any difference, it was a trend. It wasn't significant. And uh, 
the few times we did find things that uh, were considered significant using students' t-test, it flipped back and forth between treated and untreated. And uh, when we looked at it at the project level, there was uh, a really key finding, and that is consistently there were more feather mosses uh, in the treated areas than there were in the untreated. Uh, otherwise, we didn't find any significant differences in biodiversity as assessed using either Shannon Wiener or even this. And when John did his, his site typical analyses, uh, they were uh, present in both treated and untreated areas at similar levels of abundance. However, uh, one of our uh, authors challenged students' t-test. Uh, the concern was that we, given our small sample size, we couldn't be entirely sure we were dealing with a normal population. And so uh, we, we went to Doug Pitt, who uh, is a biometrician, uh, and asked for his advice, and he suggested we use a permutation, a Monte Carlo permutation to test to compare treated and untreated areas. So what we do in that test is we roll together treated and untreated and generate a whole bunch of uh, uh, T values. And then we compare the T value we determined for the um, the uh, the data we measured in the field and that approach gave us a much more unequivocal result there were no significant differences in any of the indices we used so that's a, a pretty unequivocal outcome and uh to give you an uh, and that's again for the uh the overall ground vegetation biodiversity so there's what shannon wiener looked like that's the permuted distribution, and the red line is the uh, the calculated H for the uh, uh, treated area, treated area in the eight blocks we measured. And there's evenness. And there is aspen density. So you can see where we did have uh, a significant and noticeable difference, the permutation test affirmed that for us. And uh, I'm not quite sure why this crept in. We've already seen it, but there it is. Uh, I know why it is. There we are at 10 years after treatment. Here we are at 24 years after treatment on the same site. So uh, you can see uh, they are very different forests between treated and untreated. Uh, but both are are diverse, and both are essentially within the bounds of the ecosite on which they occur. And again, uh, my personal antipathy to Calamagrostis pops up. Uh, one of the challenges we have with this this work, and there, there are two or three here. One of them is that uh, all of this work occurred in lower foothills. And as a consequence, we didn't get into uh, some of the more challenging reforestation sites like Calamagrostis canadensis. Um, and another challenge with this work is it's only eight openings. And uh, I mean, it's 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 really interesting, it's really exciting to have done this, but I recognize that uh, it would really be nice to have sufficient replication that we didn't have to go to the permutation approach to give us the statistical strength uh, to do these comparisons. Uh, but I, I would say one of the biggest problems here is the Calamagrostis issue. And the reason I say that is because Calamagrostis has a tremendous impact on biodiversity. I mean, I've never quantified it, uh, but I've certainly seen it. Um, and uh, what you're seeing here is two blocks. Uh, the block on the uh, left, was treated with herbicide, the block on the right was not. Other than that, the reforestation regime was pretty much identical. 
Uh, it involved uh, line mounting, or sorry, excavator mounting, uh, planting at pretty high density with uh, medium-sized container stock and doing all of that very promptly after harvest. And uh, you can see the, the difference. And I really think that uh, a next step following the work we've done here would be to, uh, to do a similar analysis in, uh, in a Calamagrostis uh, driven system. So uh, the conclusions that we we're drawing from the work we did is that uh, in the medium term, herbicide use results in substantial increases in conifer density and volume. And uh, this is not a, not a surprise. I mean, all, the, uh, all this stuff I cited earlier in the presentation is saying the same thing. Uh, so we're, we're consistent with others on that one. Uh, and certainly also consistent is the fact that the, uh, the increases or changes in conifer are paralleled by reductions in deciduous density and volume. So we're trading one for the other in using herbicides. And it would appear herbicide use does result in a slight initial reduction in plant biodiversity, but these differences diminish to almost nothing over time. That brings me to the end of uh, the slide deck, but I'd be happy to entertain questions.